Good morning to this beautiful snow. I was looking for six inches and didn't get it. So keep praying for me. If you have your Bibles this morning, we're going to finish our study that we've started quite a while again in the fruit of the Spirit. And this morning, we're going to look at faithfulness. Faithfulness. In his letter to the Galatians, in chapter 5, verse 22, I want to read, the Apostle Paul writes this. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. So this morning, we're going to focus on the last one, uh, not that I kept in order, called faithfulness. Faithfulness. You know, years ago, if you were around, uh, there was a headline of a major newspaper, tabloid, proclaiming, and they said it wouldn't last. See, in the paper, it was celebrating the first wedding anniversary of a very well-known couple whose marriage many had predicted wouldn't last. The tabloid was gleamfully proclaiming that the predictions were all wrong and that the marriage was healthy and strong. Who were they talking about? Who was this famous couple? It was Michael Jackson and Lisa Marie Presley, whose marriages ended soon afterwards. Now, not only was the tabloid absolutely wrong, right, about the state of their marriage, but it also revealed to you and I the weakness of modern society and suggestion that if a marriage lasts one year, it has really, really lasted. Well, anyway, uh, Hallmark has a card that fits the mood of our time by saying this. I can't promise you forever, but I can promise you today. I thought about that, and I said, you know, that's about as deep a commitment as some are willing to make today. It really is. But in contrast to that, God exhibits an honest faithfulness. In Psalm 100, verse 5 says, the Lord is good, and his love endures for a minute. What was it? How long? Forever. Forever, it says. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Is God faithful? Amen, isn't he? Every time you see a rainbow, remember that God is faithful. He keeps his promises. Every time you pick up a Bible, remember that he said, Heaven and earth will do what? Pass away, right? But my word will never pass away. That's in Matthew chapter 24, verse 35. Every time you gather to worship with brothers and sisters in Christ, remember that he said, where two and three come together in my name, there I am with them. That's in really Matthew chapter 18, verse 20. Every time we partake of communion. Every time someone answers the invitation, remember that he said, I will be with you always, even to the end of the world forever. The Lord will be with us forever, faithful. And when you stand on the brink of death, remember his promise. In my father's house, there are many rooms or mansions, I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me. For where I am, there you will be also. Faithfulness by a heavenly father. Are you that faithful? The songwriter is right when he says this. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my father. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. You know, I, I wish I could do justice to sing that for you this morning. Maybe we'll a little bit. 
But even though I can't, I can still proclaim that our God, our God is a faithful God. And that his faithfulness continues through all generations. And if we allow his spirit to work within us, then the fruit of faithfulness will be real and evident in our lives. I want you to think this morning, how faithful are you? Think about that. The more we yield to his guidance, the less fickle, the less vulnerable to discouragement and temptation will become. See, as we're filled with his spirit, others will find us reliability in us, with church trustworthy, staying power through both good and bad. If we're really faithful, you'll see those signs. You know, I believe that faithfulness in this world, the people really don't understand what that means. To begin with, let's define faithfulness and make sure that we're talking about the same thing. If, you're, if we're going to define faithfulness, as Paul uses in the New Testament, how would you do it? Well, if you look it up in the dictionary, you would find a technical definition that says to follow through with a commitment regardless of difficulty. And that's a good definition. But let me give you one that may be easier to remember. Faithfulness is love hanging on. Think of that. Faithfulness is love hanging on. It is love saying, I will not quit. There are many who may be misunderstanding faithfulness. Think of that. There may be disappointments in life, right? There may be discouragement, but I will not quit. Is that what you say? I will not quit. It is loving hanging on. If a husband says, I really love my wife, then goes out and has fun with someone else, an affair. You may call him a liar. You may call him a cheat. But most of all, you would say, he is unfaithful. Because that is what he has been. And no matter how strong his argument may be, no matter how loudly he proclaims his love for his wife, you will not believe him. You will not. Because his unfaithfulness neglects his proclamation of love. You know, if someone says, I really love the Lord, or I really love the church, and then is unfaithful, then it's hard to believe that he really does love the Lord, because you see, faithfulness and love always go hand in hand. Remember that. Faithfulness always goes hand in hand. Always. Faithfulness is love hanging on. You may get discouraged. You may. You may be disappointed. But faithfulness says, even though there is discouragement and disappointment, I will not let go. I will not quit. I will keep on attending and giving and serving because God has called me to be faithful. So who's called you to be faithful? God? Really? Has he really to you? You can stand up to that and say yes. Listen to what the Bible says. Here are some scriptures that challenge us to be faithful. Let's just look a couple. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, challenges us to be faithful in stewardship. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 21, talks about being faithful in service. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 9, speaks of being faithful in our marriages. In Revelations chapter 2, verse 15, speaks of being faithful in witnessing. Huh. So who'd you witness to this week? Hmm? In Romans 12, verse 12 says, we are to be faithful in prayer. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 7, speaks of being faithful in ministry. In Revelations chapter 17, verse 14 says, we are to be faithful in following the Lord. In Proverbs chapter 31, verse 26, 
speaks of faithful instructions. Third John, verse three says, we are to be faithful in the truth. Revelation chapter 13, verse 10, speaks of faithfulness even in times of persecution. Then you can go to Revelation, chapter 2, verse 10, says we ought to be faithful unto death, and then we'll receive what? The crown of life, aren't we? You know, one of the hot box office attractions years ago was a movie called Bridges Over Madison County. Maybe you've seen it. It was advertised as the world's greatest love story. I didn't really see it, but I did read the reviews on it. It starred Clint Eastwood as a traveling photographer and Meryl Streep as a housewife. They be met and began having a wonderful affair. Then after four days, they ended it and go their separate ways. You know what? And then Hollywood called it the world's greatest love story. Can you imagine that? You see, the world really doesn't understand faithfulness today. I'm surprised it's not out of dictionary next year. It doesn't even have a clue as to what Paul is talking about when he says the fruit of the Spirit is what? Faithfulness. Faithfulness. You know, to help us better understand it, let's look at a demonstration of faithfulness in the Bible. Once again, the example is Jesus, and he is found in the 18th chapter of Matthew. Now, in verse 21, it tells us that Jesus brings his disciples together. You'll, get to, you'll recognize the story. And tells them he is going to Jerusalem and tells them, I know what will happen there. I'm going to be arrested and beaten and crucified, but I'm going anyway. You may remember that in the next phrase, Peter tries to stop him. He said, Lord, don't go. Don't go. But Jesus says, get thee behind me, Satan. Now, Here's the reason that he called Peter Satan. Because Satan was using Peter to try to get Jesus to quit, to be unfaithful to his calling. Again and again throughout his ministry, Satan tries to tempt Jesus to be unfaithful. Don't go to the cross, Jesus. That's Satan. Don't die for their sins. Just quit. It's going to be too tough. There'll be too many obstacles, too many difficulties. Just turn around and quit, Jesus. See, that's how Satan speaks to you, too. Yet here, the King James Version tells us that Jesus set his face steadfastly toward Jerusalem. Jesus was determined that no matter what happened, he would be faithful to the mission God had him to do. So steadfastly, he goes to where? To Jerusalem. Even while he's hanging on a cross. Picture that. The people below him were mocking him, saying, if you're really the son of God, come down from the cross. See, that's what Satan was saying, to quit. Quit. Come down. It's not worth it. The pain is too intense. The people don't care anyway. Just quit. Just quit. But he continued to hang there until the finally he says, you remember that at the cross? Father, forgive them for they don't know what they are doing. And into thy hands I commit my spirit. See, that is faithfulness. That's faithfulness unto death. And the faithfulness of Jesus has inspired the faithfulness of others down through the ages. Those who hung in there through the good and the bad, through times of plenty and times of want, that's true faithfulness. There are the people who were here when this church began. I just read the history because it's getting to be 114, 15 years old, this church. And there were people who were here when this church began. 
They're the people who built the old church building over there and then sacrificed through the depression years to pay for it. I think it cost $600, if I remember. They were here praying when it wasn't easy to pray anymore because the doors were going to close down. They were here through the good times and they were here through the bad times. There must have been many times they were tempted to quit. I know that. I've talked to some. Tempted to say, I'm sorry, it's too big of a job to keep these doors open. I don't want to hang in there anymore. But God had called them to be faithful. So down through the years, they hung in there and they were faithful. Faithful. And recipients to their faithfulness. George Mueller began praying for five of his friends. He prayed five years before the first one was converted. For the next one, he prayed 10 years. For the third one, 25 years. For the fourth, nearly 50 years. The last one was converted after 52 years at George Mueller's funeral. See, George Mueller was faithful even unto death. That's the point. That's what call God calls us to do. Be faithful just for a day. No, he says unto death. Be faithful. So finally, let's ask the question. How do we develop faithfulness? How do you? In order to answer this, you need to realize that an apple tree doesn't stand out in the middle of an orchard saying, now, how do I develop apples? An apple tree produces apples because that's what apple trees do, right? And when we are spirit-led Christians, when we are a branch attached to the vine who is Jesus Christ, I want to ask you that. Are you attached to Jesus Christ? Is he the vine in your life? You're attached to Jesus Christ. Then we produce fruit because it's a natural thing to do. We don't have to sit around and think about it and analyze it, but we do have to be careful that our branch is never detached from the vine. Who's the vine? Jesus. I can't hear you. Jesus. Jesus is the vine. Are you attached to him all the time? Are you faithful to him all the time? If we're not, some of these will destroy our faithfulness in our life. So there are certain things we need to be careful about. Number one, we need to realize that temptations will come. How many here has never been tempted? Just as surely as Jesus was tempted to be unfaithful, we will be tempted to be unfaithful. Maybe in our marriage, in our relationship with the Lord, or even in the church. That's what Satan does. He will tempt us to be unfaithful. 24-7 he will. <coughs> Secondly, we need to seek the Holy Spirit's reinforcement and develop regular positive spiritual habits. This world is not a Christian world, folks. Just listen to the radio this morning, they're giving some percentages. It's not a Christian world. This nation is not a Christian nation, and we're being pressured in every side to develop negative habits, tempting us to be unfaithful in church attendance, to be unfaithful in prayer, and in studying the Word of God. You know, Satan's laughing at you. <laughs> he doesn't go to Bible school anymore or as a church. <laughs> I think of that often. Very often. You know, Simon Peter is one of the heroes of scriptures. See, some of the things we ought to do, but if we'll say, get thee behind me, Satan, and be determined to serve God faithfully, see, then people will be able to count on us 
will be consistent and trustworthy and reliable. We'll develop these habits so they come automatically in your life. And then Satan tempts us. We will not be sincerely tempted because we've developed the habits of faithfulness and not to quit. So finally, we need to get back up when we fall or are knocked down. Simon Peter is one of my heroes in the scriptures. But not because he's always did right. Sometimes he made glaring mistakes. Even dying for the Lord. And he wept bitterly because of what he had done. But something about him, every time he fell down, he got back up again. So when it came time to choose someone to preach the very first gospel sermon on the day of Pentecost, guess who was chosen? Peter. So the Holy Spirit said, Simon Peter, you do it. You've had the experience of being down and getting back up again. You made some mistakes, and these people need to know that. They need to hear how valuable and vulnerable you've been. But despite all that, God is able to do his work through you. I think we forget that one. God's there to do the work through you. He's just asking you to be faithful. And he'll do his work through you. And the same is true of Saul Tars, who became the Apostle Paul. He experienced all kinds of persecution when you read his word. All kinds of discoveries, all kinds of temptation. Yet he didn't give up. Then it came that glorious day when the Apostle Paul wrote these words in Timothy. It's chapter 4, starting at verse 8, I believe, through... No, verse 6 through verse 8. It says this, The time has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. You know, I wonder this morning, in many days as I pray for you, I wonder, are you going through a painful experience now? Do you feel that you've been knocked down? Or maybe you've fallen? Have you been fickled and irresponsible? Are you tempted to quit? I've had enough, I quit. Don't stop. Keep pressing on. Hang in there, because faithfulness is love hanging on. Say that with me. Faithfulness is love hanging on. Isn't that neat? So if you're here this morning outside of Jesus right now, you haven't been faithful, and you don't know him as your Lord anymore or Savior, we want you to know that Jesus didn't quit on you. He didn't quit. I thank the Lord many times, Lord, thank you for not quitting on me. He didn't quit. He went all the way to the cross. Just look at that. No, I'm not going to the cross for you. (laughs) He went all the way to the cross and gave his life so that you and I might have the promise of everlasting life. So someone's life feeling like that, your salvation is available to you. Jesus Christ is faithful. And when you're knocked down and you try to get up by yourself, you'll find his, Jesus' strong, strong, strong arm there to help you get back on your feet. So if you're here and you have a decision on your heart this morning, we encourage you to come to Jesus because he's always faithful. He's not only faithful for the day, he's faithful forever. Father, we thank you for your word. Our prayer is that we be encouraged to be faithful in all things, in your name, for you, for our families, for our friends, for even those who are our enemies, that we're so faithful, Father, 
that they would say, why are you different? And we're faithful to Jesus Christ. That's why we're different. So throughout this week, and as we on the stepping stones to the greatest faithfulness of Jesus Christ being born and come to this earth to die for us. That's faithfulness. And we thank you for his faithfulness and his love every day. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen.